Chapter 2, Frequency Distributions. This is part 1 of the lecture, and we'll begin with our learning objectives for this particular chapter. Learning outcomes or learning objectives are as follows. We'll understand how frequency distributions are used. We'll learn how to organize data into frequency distribution table, a simple frequency distribution table, as well as a group frequency distribution table. We'll learn how to interpret frequency distributions organize data into frequency distribution graphs, and know how to interpret and understand the different types of graphs presented in this chapter. The tools you will need. Um, from this point forward, each chapter will begin with a, slight li a, a brief list of things that you will need to review to ensure your success. As you will learn, um, every chapter builds skills on the, um, using the previous chapter. So it's cumulative. So things that you learned in Chapter 1 are going to appear in Chapter 2, in Chapter 3, in Chapter 4, and so on and so forth. So we need to make sure that we've mastered those previous skills so that we can add to them and broaden what we've already learned. So we'll begin with proportions. Um, the math review that we reviewed back in week one is essential for understanding the skills and concepts of chapter two. So for some reason, a lot of students have difficulty with proportions. It seems to be um, an area of weakness for a lot of students. I haven't quite figured out why. But um, if you think of proportions just as a part of a whole, hopefully that can help you better grasp this concept. And we can express those um, values as fractions, decimals, or percentages. So just briefly, um, you know, we often talk about pieces of a pie or pizza. Let's say we have a whole pizza and we have four friends, so each friend is going to get one-fourth of the pizza. Right, so this is a fraction, and one fourth is the equivalent of a proportion. A proportion is a decimal of 0.25, which is also equal to 25%. So we can um, express the amount of pizza, the part of the whole that each friend is going to be allocated. And if we're going to do an equal distribution, each person will receive a fourth which is equivalent to a proportion or decimal of 0.25 and a percent of 25%. We're going to be using um, these concepts a lot, especially when we get into probability. What are the chances of something occurring? It can be expressed as a decimal, a proportion, or as a percentage. So if you're having um, difficulty with these concepts, please go back to the math review do the exercises that are provided, read the section that's relevant to these concepts um, because they are essential. Next, scales of measurement. From chapter one, we learned nominal, briefly, named categories, ordinal, named categories that are ranked, interval, ranked categories that um, have equal increments in between each category, and then finally, ratio scale of measurement. It has a meaningful zero, enables us to make racial comparisons. For example, someone has twice as much money as someone else. There are three times as many children in, in one class versus the other, so on and so forth. And then we also um, learned about continuous versus discrete variables. So, so continuous, they can be infinitely broken into smaller sections, so that relates to proportions, decimals, whereas discrete variables are whole numbers um, and cannot be broken down into smaller components. Real limits, as we learned, um, are relevant to continuous variables, um, and they serve the purpose of helping us determine a range of values um, within a certain category, and this is useful when we're graphing, and we'll see the use of real limits um, when we get into the graphs in this chapter. All right, so again, these are the things that we will need to know to move on in developing new skills. So frequency distributions. Frequency means how often. Um, and so we're going to move into, or what we're doing in Chapter 2, is moving into descriptive statistics. Is actually putting um, that to use. We learned in Chapter 1 
Descriptive statistics is organizing and summarizing data, usually using graphs and tables to do so, as well as reporting the average of a distribution and the standard deviation. Measures of um, central tendency, chapter three, measures of variability, chapter five, which is um, coming up. And inferential statistics, we learned that that's the process of using a sample to draw conclusions about a population. So obviously we're going to move into descriptive statistics first, chapter two through five, and then jump into inferential statistics. So this is the first basic step of, of descriptive statistics is taking some raw data, my x values, and organizing them in a fashion that makes sense and tells a story. So we're not um, going to present our data in raw format to consumers of our research because it, it doesn't help them. Our job is to summarize, organize and summarize information so that we can say something, draw conclusions, um, and detect patterns that may exist. So frequency distribution is simply an organized um, tabulation showing the number of individuals located in each category on the scale of measurement. So for instance, we can um, show a frequency distribution, very brief example here. Let's say I'm using um, grades, so A's and B's and C's. And on quiz one, let's say I took a sample of our class and there were three A's oops, and um, five B's and nine C's. Okay, so again, the x value is our variable that we're collecting data on. In this case, could be considered the dependent variable. Um, and the frequency denoted by an f is just simply indicating how often that value occurred. So just for um, purposes of review, letter grade what scale of measurement do you think that is? Is it nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. And the correct answer would be ordinal because it's a named category and it's ranked. And the reason it's not interval or ratio is because it's not a numeric value. We know that we can convert these um, letter grades into a numeric scale when you calculate your GPA, for instance. An A is a four, a B is a three, so on and so forth. But here in their letter grade format, it's a qualitative scale of measurement and it's ranked. So we know it's an ordinal scale of measurement. So again, our X variable is the data we're collecting information on. And then the frequency is just denoting how often that value occurred. Now we can express or, or create tables or graphs. So we'll see that um, in a few slides down the road, we'll see how we can convert this table into a graph. So it just depends on what kind of visual you want to present. Many people prefer graphs um, to better understand data. People are very visual, but you can present the same information in tables. So they're synonymous with one another if you're using the same data. They can be interchanged. So we're always gonna, it's always going to show the categories that make up the scale, as I, as I mentioned here the x value in this case is the letter grade and the frequency or the number of individuals in each category. So if it were a graph it would look like this where we have our abscissa or x um, axes so here would be our x values and then here is our frequency how often something occurs. So we'll, we'll see um, the construction of histograms and, and a bar graph and line graphs all to come in subsequent slides, but just to get you, give you a sense of the difference between a table and a graph, and also explaining what we're illustrating, the x value, the category, the scale of measurement, and then the um, number of occurrences for each category. So the structure of frequency distribution tables, the categories in each column often ordered from highest to lowest they could be reversed from lowest to highest, but that's rare. We often see the highest score at the top, as in the case that I just um, showed you, right? the highest grade A, followed by B and C, and then the frequency. So the, the order in which this appears 
the most common format is highest to lowest, but again, it could be the reverse, but that's um, not the norm. The norm would be highest to lowest, and the frequency counts each category. Now, this new equation, the notation sigma f, sigma, as we've learned, refers to the summation. So if we were to take the sum of frequency, and let me go back um, for just a second to see what values I put. So I put um, frequency of 3, 5, and 9 for my example. 3, 5, and 9. If I wanted to determine, you know, the size of the sample, again, this is also equivalent to sigma f is equal to sample size. So for, again, remember, capital N pertains to the population size, lowercase m refers to sample size. So if I presented this data and asked you how many individuals are in this sample, you would simply take the sum of f, because again, the frequency, it, it refers to an occurrence. So there were three a's, five b's, and in nine C's. If we take the total of that, the summation, that gives us a sense of how many individuals total there were. Okay, so if we take nine plus five, it's 14 plus three more, and gives us 17. So you'll have questions like this where you're given, presented a table or a graph, and the frequency is denoted and you'll be asked to determine what the sample or population size is. And all you need to do is take the sum, sigma of f, the sum of frequency to determine that. So again, here n is equal to 17. n is equal to 17 because I just summed up the number of occurrences. Now to compute the sum of x, we will be using the sum of x readily when we calculate the average. Um, in a previous lecture, I had indicated that um, mu represents the average of a population. We would take the sum of x over n. m is the average of a sample, the sum of x over, excuse me, I meant capital N here, the sum of x over capital N for population and for sample, sum of x over n. So we will need to know what the sum of all our x values are, the sum of our raw scores are, to calculate the average beginning with chapter 3. So in order to do that, when um, the distribution has been consolidated into a frequency table, we'll need to utilize um, this equation of sigma fx. And I'll demonstrate that to you in just a second. But Again, recognizing that the frequency distribution is consolidating information. So instead of writing an a, a value of A three times, a value of B five times, a value of C nine times, I can consolidate it into this frequency table and just denote how often that category occurred. Save space, organizes information, summarizes it um, for the consumers of our research. So let me show you an example of what I mean in terms of sum of fx. So here is a simple distribution of x values. Um, let's say these are quiz score values um, or an assignment. Um, the possible points, highest possible points is 5. Um, and so we have our x values. So points on an assignment, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The frequency, right, the current, so how many individuals received a 5, a 4, a 3, a 2, and a 1. So first of all, if I were to say, please determine what the sample size is. We just learned that sum of f will determine how many we have in our sample. So the sum of f here, so we would add up all of these values in this column. So if we have 4 plus 4 is 8, 9, and then 3 more is equal to 12. So our sample size is equal to 12. And then um, as we get into chapter 3, and we'll need the sum of x um, to calculate the average of a sample or population, I may say what is the sum of x. And many of us will want to do the following. So we'll go over to our x column and take the sum of x and just sum, sum this val these values here. So 5 plus 
4 is 9 plus 1 more is 10 plus 2 and 3 that's equal to 15. Many of us will want to do this and I'll give you a second to ask yourselves um, if this is correct. Is this accurate? Again, the sum of x values. And the answer would be that it is not correct. And the reason is that if we take the sum of all x values and say that it's equal to 15, that's assuming that each x value occurred only once. We would then see the frequency that 5 occurred once, 4 occurred once, 3 occurred once, 2 occurred once, and 1 occurred once. And we see that that's not the case here. So this equation of sigma fx means that we have to account for the fact that we've consolidated information. And so we would calculate fx here. So we're saying that this x value occurred once. So in this case, that would equal 5. This x value of 4 occurred three times. So we have to account for all three occurrences. So 4 times 3 is equal to 12. And then the score of 3 occurred four times. So again, we have to account for the fact that it didn't occur just once, it occurred four times. So that's equal to 12. And the score of 2 occurred three times. So we would say that's equal to 6. And then 1 occurred once. Okay, so the scores of 5 and 1 were the only ones that occurred one time only. All the rest had multiple occurrences, so we have to account for that. So if we take the sum of fx, right, that's the same as the sum of x. So many of us will be um, wanting to just take the sum of x because most questions will be posed as the sum of x. But if it's in a frequency table, you need to first calculate fx and then take the summation of all of those. So again, these are equivalent. So let's calculate what the sum of fx is equal to. So we have 12 plus 12, 24, plus 5, 29, plus 6, and then one more. That's a total of 36. Okay, so the correct answer for the sum of x is equal to 36. And I'm just going to show you what exactly I did here. So this is just a shortcut, but technically what we're saying is if we listed all our x values, 5 would be listed once, 4 would be listed 3 times, 3 would be listed 4 times, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2 would be listed 3 times, 1, 2, 3, and then 1 would be listed once. So here is this data stretched out, all right, um, illustrating exactly how often each value occurred. So the sum of x here, if we took the sum of all of these values, we should get 36. Um, but here's a shortcut using fx, and the sum of fx is just a quick way of determining the summation of all our x values are the variable that we're interested in. So make sure you don't make this mistake here, um, which is very common. Make sure that you're accounting for the fact that most x values have more than one occurrence. Okay, so as I indicated before, proportions percentage is quite important in terms of statistics and probability. So proportion measures the fraction of the total group that is associated with each score. So again, a part of the whole. And you'll see this equation is proportion is equal to P, P representing proportion, is equal to the frequency over N. It's how often something occurred over how often it could have occurred, right? How many A's do we have out of the whole class? So that's often also referred to as relative frequency, and you'll see me often write relative frequency in this manner, rel f. So it's the frequency in relation to the total number. So again, we want to understand, you know, taking each x value, each category, and relating it to the entire whole. You know, what portion of the whole represent, is represented by this particular x value. For um, purposes of expressing information more, 
more easily, we often convert things into percentages because it's much more um, understood um, in terms of the lay public understanding what the information conveys. So proportions are often presented as percentages just because they're easier to understand. Um, so it expresses relative frequency out of 100. So the equation is percentage is equal to the proportion multiplied by 100, which is the same as saying frequency over n multiplied by 100. And often in the table it can be included as a separate column in a frequency distribution table. So again, just to simplify things, for some reason proportions scare people. When it expresses as a percentage, it tends to make more sense. Let's take an example um, that we can walk through so that you understand the different um, relationships between, team, between these values. All right, let's consider the um, population of the U.S. So U.S. population. If I give you a moment to think about what, what percentage um, do you think the U.S. makes of the entire world? Um, so you may be thinking of some numbers. Sometimes my students will say in, in class 30%, 20%, 6%, whatever they think uh, in terms of their view of our country in relation to the whole world's population. So if I were to tell you that the U.S. makes up approximately 325 million is comprised of 325 million individuals, right? And the world population may have increased, but um, let's say approximately 7.3 billion and growing, right? So now what we want to know is what proportion or percentage does the U.S. population make of the entire world's population? So again, we learned just now that proportion is equal to frequency over n. So f is the frequency that the amount of population in the U.S. over the total population of the world. So let's convert everything into millions. Um, 325 million over... 7,300 million, we take the 7.3 billion and, and um, make it into a common denominator of 7,300 million. So let's do the math and see what the proportion is equal to. So in our, go ahead and do that in your calculator with me to make sure we're on the same page. So if we take 325 divided by 7,300, and we get a proportion of 0 0.0445, okay? And again, that's representing the proportion of the U.S. population in relation to the entire world's population. And um, if we want to convert that to percentage, we know that we simply take our proportion, multiply by 100, so that would be 0 0.0445 multiplied by 100 and some students say oh you move the decimal two places to write yes so that technically what you're doing is multiplying by 100 and so we then express the U.S. makes up 4.45 percent of the world's population so again here we take something that's very relevant that you have familiarity with and um, see that we take a, a fraction of a whole, the fraction of the whole, whole world's population, express it as the U.S. population, and then express it as a proportion, this fraction, and then as a percentage. So again, we would say that the U.S. makes up 4.45% of the world's population. And finally, here's another example illustrating um, x values, frequency, proportion, percent. So we have our x value, and these are the values that we have of our variable of interest, how often each of those values occurred. And we calculated um, the proportion, and to do so, we need n. How do we calculate n? We learned that n is equal to the sum of f. 
So let's take the sum of f here. We have 6 here, 7, 8, 9, 10. So n is equal to 10, and that's where this 10 is coming from here. So if we were to say the score of 5 occurred once, right, that makes up 1 out of 10 of the occurrences, and it's equal to a proportion of 0.1 or 10%. So we would say that of this sample of 10 individuals, right, 10% scored a 5. Um, let's look at this one here. This one where we say the x value is equal to 3, it occurred 3 times. We can know that n is equal to 10. So 3, right, the number of times that it occurred, 3 times, over the total number of occurrences, total possible was 10. So 3 over 10 gives us a proportion of 0.3. And we would say 30% of the sample scored a 3. Right, so again, uh, lastly here, um, we'll do this one since this one's a little different, the second one x value of equal to 4. It occurred two times, so the proportion would be calculated by taking its frequency. It occurred twice out of the total number of frequencies, 10. So it could have occurred 10 times, but it only occurred twice. And that is equal to a proportion of 0.2, 2 over 10, and it's equal to a percentage of 20. So 20% 20 of the sample scored a 4. So again, we could say for this last one, 20% of the 10 individuals scored a 4. Okay, so we'll learn how to express these, understand how the calculations um, are conducted, and then also to read a table um, such as this, a group frequency, excuse me, a simple frequency table that includes proportions and percentages. And that's it for part one. Um, next part will, of chapter two will include group frequency distribution. So the process of consolidating information even further than a simple frequency distribution does. Um, again, allowing for larger sets of data uh, to be expressed or summarized and organized in a fashion that makes sense or tells a story or demonstrates some kinds of patterns.